morning, everybody. I appreciate you coming this morning. We're here for a meeting with our expert parking panel, our parking advisory panel. This is part of a larger project, our uh, downtown parking plan. Our parking plan includes lots of issues, including uh, neighborhood issues, funding issues, supply and demand issues. This is about a year-long project, and uh, my name is Randy Hensley. I'm the parking services manager. I would also like to introduce Timothy Wilder. Timothy is right over here. Timothy is the project manager for the parking plan, works for the city, part of our advanced planning department. And before I introduce our panel and turn it over to them, and I'm going to make my introduction short because I know you are all here. You want to hear from them. You don't necessarily want to hear from me. But I've had several people ask me what happens after we hear from the panel and they go back to their homes, what do we do next? And the answer to that question is that this is a great starting point. We're going to hear some interesting stuff this morning, and then it's time for us to take what we've heard and have a conversation. Timothy and I have been on a road show for the past three months where we've been going out and talking with people about the downtown parking plan, and we're going to continue that. So we're going to be going out to all the people we've talked to before and talk to them again, but now we're going to have some very specific stuff that we're going to be talking about. So we're going to continue the conversation. Ultimately, the parking plan will be going to our city council in April of 2012, and we'll be asking them to approve the plan at that time. Prior to that time, we'll have public meetings and lots of opportunity for people to provide input. So let me get back to the real reason that you all are here, and that's to introduce our, our panel. And I'm going to step over here. Uh, this panel has been great. Uh, they are fantastic folks. Every one of them is an expert in their own right, in their own area. And believe me, they have been working hard while they are here. They've been starting early. They've been going late. Uh, one of these panelists, and I won't say which one, was up till 2.30 in the morning polishing this presentation last night. But they've all been working very, very hard. Uh, <laughs> I think the cat's out of the bag. Um, the, uh, a lot of these panelists here have volunteered their own time. They've come here without compensation. That's because they have an interest in parking and they have an interest in helping us here in our community with our parking issues. Starting over here, we have Vanessa Rogers from Cedar Rapids. Uh, next to her is Eric Anderson from Tacoma, Washington. Then we have Ann Guest from Missoula, Montana. Uh, Dennis Burns from the Phoenix area. Molly Winter from down the road in Boulder, and Dave Fian from Maryland. What city in Maryland? Silver Springs. Silver Springs, Maryland. Great panel. Like I say, they've been working hard. I would like to ask you to help me give them a big thank you for being here. Yeah. So I'm going to turn this over to Dennis, who is going to start this out, and then uh, eventually we're going to hear from everybody here, but Dennis is going to start us off. Oh, one thing else I wanted to add is after the panel finishes with their presentation, we will have some time for some question and answers. So we'll do that too. Actually, you're going to use that yes. mic there. Okay. Well, here's your glorious panel again, after some coffee and mugs. Um, the purpose of this panel, from our point of view, is really to examine parking and access issues in downtown and develop a strategic and sustainable parking plan. And uh, one of the things that's very important to the city is the triple bottom line, uh, which has to do with sustainability, economics, and uh, place. Um, we want to discuss best practices. We want to do look at successful parking strategies employed by other communities, and particularly look at downtown tourism, residential development, and all those issues as they relate to parking and transportation. We try not to divorce those two. Uh, we're going to be identifying opportunities for new parking and transportation program initiatives uh, that will support the community strategic goals and economic development. And I think that connection is very important. This presentation you're seeing right now is our preliminary recommendations, again, after just a couple of days in your community. But the report that will come out of this will be a couple of weeks in the preparation and we'll be vetted through all the panelists and um, and then we'll have an actual report which will become part of the larger parking plan. I just wanted to share with you some of our impressions of your community. 
we heard that Fort Collins was really a magical place. So what did we see? What do outsiders think of your community? Well, what a great retail district you have. I mean, just very interesting shops, uh, really well presented. I just haven't seen this great a retail in a very long time. And the shops are very unique. We just really enjoyed just going from shop to shop. Your public art is really great, and there's a lot of it. Um, just really beautiful stuff, really enhances your community. And it's well used. I mean, I saw kids playing on this stuff every single day we were here. Your alley projects have really done a great job of improving your pedestrian access to your parking assets. And I remember what they looked like before. And uh, it's such a great improvement. I mean, just look at these pictures. It's really, really well done. Uh, talk about clean and safe. Downtown business districts really focus on clean and safe. And yours is one of the cleanest cities I think we've ever seen. Not just great restaurants, but great outdoor dining. You really are taking advantage of your lovely climate uh, here. And we've really, really enjoyed that. Uh, good urban design standards. We said one of the comments in the from the panelists was this community really gets walkability. You've made great investments in transportation. You're making more investments in transportation. And based on what we see coming down the road, we think this is really critical and really important. And uh, I think the city should be applauded for all those investments, both in planning and in infrastructure. Uh, your public facilities are just great. I mean, we're in one right now. They, they're really attractive. They're really functional. I think they really add to the quality of your community. Very well preserved and uh, historic architectural assets just makes your community just really something special. Landscaping, I mean, flowers, flowers everywhere. I couldn't stop taking pictures. You're lucky we don't have 10 slides of flowers. Uh, you really like your bikes here. Uh, Talk about alt modes. That's really an interesting alt mode. Um, uh, you're getting very creative with your bike parking and, bike and bicycle planning as well. One of the important things about our parking plan is to integrate it with bike parking and your overall bike plan and your overall uh, downtown transportation plan. Little things like your utility boxes really just, again, make this community something special. I've seen the utility boxes everywhere. I've never seen this anywhere. But, uh, but look how well used it is. I mean, it's, just, it's not just something that sits there. Living with the train. <laughs> we had to go from uh, one building to the other, and uh, we had a good excuse for being late. Oh, yeah, we were supposed to be looking at parking. I'm sorry. Um, what were we thinking about? A really thriving business district, and one of the outcomes of success is parking problems, so that's a good thing, really. Um, you have an on-street parking system that really needs management because it's so important to those businesses and their success. But these maps just show you some of the, what you're going to get further down the road with the parking plan, but everything in red is above 85 to 90 percent utilization. Look at all that red. So. We need some new management tools because things are going to get, the demand is going to get even greater going forward. So that's one of the important things we've been looking at. We really do think that your parking program is very well managed. Uh, some of the cleanest, brightest garages, your technology is up to date. Uh, things are well painted, they're well kept. There's interesting graphics. Um, they're very safe. We did notice some signage issues. I mean, of all the things that we could have looked at, the only thing that we really popped out of as a, as a huge negative, not even huge, uh, is uh, some signage issues. Um, and that's just really a, an age thing. And it's really, we brought an expert with us. I don't think any of you got to meet him. His name's Todd Pierce. He's doing some of the best parking signage in the country. And he was here during our kickoff meeting a few weeks ago. And so we've got some good ideas coming up related to signage. Sustainability in parking is something that's growing. You've got several examples of uh, permeable pavements, bioswales, uh, electric vehicle charging stations. So you're really ahead of most cities in this regard. 
So those are just some of our initial impressions. So a little bit about our process. So you know we had a public meeting a few days ago. We've had a series of uh, specific stakeholder interviews. And uh, we received a lot of good community input on that. So when we got together as a panel, we kind of did a brain dump and said, what did we hear? What are our observations ourselves and what do we hear from, from the community? Well, we probably, I could have probably made 30 slides, but I didn't. You'll be happy to know. But you know, just some of the a sampling of either some of our observations, if it's in quotes, it's, uh, it's something that came from, from you in the audience, but you have no commercial park, retail parking, or no commercial parking requirements in the downtown. Parking facilities are very clean. Uh, the BRT will have a big impact on town, but we kind of felt like that was a little undefined. People know it's coming, people are excited about it, but what it will really mean is, is, is a little undefined, we think. Lots of bikes, we were so impressed with the bike culture here. Uh, several of you told us about the upside down parking pricing that was free right on the street, right in front of a store, but you'd have to pay to park in the garage, which is less convenient. Um, you told us the two hour parking uh, limit may not be enough to do everything you'd want to do in a community with this much uh, interesting retail and shopping and dining and museums. And you really prize the uniqueness of your downtown. You don't want to be anything generic. You want to keep your, the little things that make you special. Uh, you're beginning to see uh, more uh, intrusion into the neighborhoods with parking, both from the downtown and from CSU. And that's a trend that's going to continue. And it's one of those things we're keeping our eye on from a management point of view. We've heard that wayfinding needs improvement. Parking facilities, from our point of view, structurally and in other ways, are in good shape. Employee parking abuse, you told us, was a very big problem. Uh, urban and rural customer base. And that may get to some of the hesitancy of using off-street facilities. Um, but there are some that are really familiar and really uh, aware of uh, what it's like to park in an urban environment. And there are some that maybe are not, are not quite that familiar uh, or comfortable. You asked us about the need for extending parking enforcement into the evenings and potentially weekends. Uh, the price of parking here, from our point of view, is incredibly cheap. And that fact seems, you just accept that as maybe one of the special things about Fort Collins. Um, but from any, other, from any other place, it's really, you really have it great here. There's a real need, we think, with all the changes that we see coming, uh, to identify future parking needs and start building uh, a plan for that. And that's exactly what the city's doing. They're being proactive with this parking plan uh, because they know this thing is coming. Somebody says that parking's not really a problem. You just troll for spaces and it works out. Keep Fort Collins non-standard. Again, we don't want to, to become anywhere USA. CSU is a great asset. Maybe not fully exploited in terms of its uh, role with the downtown, but with the uh, Mason Corridor coming, that's going to change. And the growth of CSU is going to have a big impact going down the road. Transition areas. Um, what were identified as transition areas in the strategic plan uh, are really starting to develop into major employment corridors. Uh, I believe Jim made this comment about parking relates to profitability, and I think that's a, a really insightful comment. We all kind of like that. Um, we did a lot of talking about public-private partnerships, uh, and you've got some experience, but not a whole lot of experience there, and we think that's something that's going to be important in the future. Um, the demographics are changing in Fort Collins. We heard that from you. Um, we also heard that we're doing well now. We, we're on a good path. Uh, we all agree to that. But uh, to really take it to the next level, um, some of you think that something big needs to happen in terms of development and the way we approach development and um, incentivizing development. Um, another quote, we need to constantly fine tune the machine. We, we thought that had a, had a lot of value in that and we think we've seen that over the course of time and you've told us about that. Jefferson Street, you told us was a problem zone, primary related to the issues of the state highway running right out front. Um, 
someone said the SOVs do not fit our single occupant vehicles, excuse me, do not fit our visions of ourselves. You're very uh, transportation savvy. You don't like single occupant vehicles. You'd much rather bike or walk uh, or telecommute. The triple bottom line focus again, and we really like that. We like the idea that we're taking everything back to that standard to make sure that the recommendations we make will have positive impacts on your economy and on your, uh, your place and on your profitability. Um, someone said fear of losing downtown again because of the fear of park people not being able to find a parking. I think that's a very, uh, that's a, that's a very, as things progress, we think that that uh, may be a very insightful comment. And so it's time to be planning ahead and we're doing that. Uh, low crime, feeling of safety. Um, I shouldn't tell you this because it just makes me look like an idiot. But last time I was here, I had coffee at Muggs and I was waiting for, uh, for Timothy. And I had my camera. So I start walking around, taking pictures, which is what I like to do. I left my laptop sitting on a chair in front of Muggs for 30 minutes before I realized it. And I got back and it was still sitting there. I was like, wow, I got to move to Fort Collins. <laughs> um, you really take advantage of the benefits of your place and your climate. Downtown, someone said, is in danger of being perceived as the enforcement zone because parking is not just overtime violations that are enforced, but a lot of other small things. Um, and that's just something to be sensitive to. Uh, the enforcement function is doing a great job. They're doing their job. They're enforcing the codes and, and the laws. But uh, when you do that in a concentrated area and you don't get that treatment anywhere else, it can start to create a perception in the mind of, of uh, your customers. Uh, we've heard need more parking, bicycle parking, both covered and unpark covered. Uh, parking is very personal. This is uh, there was never a truer statement, I don't think. You can do a lot of different things in the world. We, I led a panel in Chicago of uh, privatization, monetization experts, and they've done toll roads and buildings. But when they tried to do parking in Chicago, they said, we would never do that again. If people, it just impacts people on such a personal level on so many ways. Um, this was another kind of insightful comment, that parking at this point is just a slight aggravation, but it's not, there's not a lot of pain there yet. But that's, that pain could come if we don't do the right things uh, going forward. Uh, I think there's a real recognition that the enhanced parking enforcement program of the last few years has really achieved some good results. There's a need for increased collaboration between parking management and the business community as we start looking at new tools and new issues uh, relative to parking. Uh, in general, this is not a comment about Fort Collins, but in general, there are very few tools in the toolbox to manage parking. You have time limits, permits perhaps, pricing is a big one, but pricing is kind of off the table here. We don't have on-street paid parking to use as a tool to help uh, uh, modify behaviors and promote turnover and those kinds of things. Um, and it's getting to the point now, someone said that every space counts. And that's gonna be even more true going forward. Um, this slide is kind of leading us to where do we think things are going and what do we, why do we need to be concerned? Well, someone said that we're not, we were not prepared for a surge in primary employment in downtown. And uh, we think that that was probably true. And some of the intrusion into neighborhoods is a reflection of that. Um, going forward, parking is gonna be a critical factor, someone said. There's a need for clearly defined parking related economic development policy. We think that's very much true. Um, sort of the questions of how much new development is coming, what kind is it, and where is it gonna be and when, those are all things we're gonna be looking at as part of the larger parking plan. And the one that really struck us, I think, right between the eyes was the comment that parking is a giant unfunded uh, liability at this point you know you're gonna need more parking going forward if all the positive things that we've seen uh, continue to move forward on the path that they're going, 
and all the investments that you're making in, in other areas pay off. How we fund additional parking going forward is a big question mark. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and he's gonna walk us through a little bit of the analysis process and then ultimately our recommendations. Well, thanks Dennis and it's great to see all of you again. We almost feel like we've uh, made about 50 new friends in town and I recognize a lot of familiar faces. Um, just a few quick comments, uh, I think reflecting what I've heard from some of the panelists and, and my own observations. Um, this is a place, there's a sense of magic about this place and, and we heard that over and over again uh, and that we want to preserve that. I grew up uh, years ago in, my, in Minneapolis. Uh, any of you ever been to Minneapolis? Quite a few of you. Um, Minneapolis is a very, on a larger scale, a very, very nice town. Lots of lakes and, and uh, river and, and uh, bike paths and, and parks and all kinds of things. Um, a friend of mine, a guy, a guy I got to know who actually is from Texas, came there to head the Citizens League. And he'd been there a few months. Um, and he said, you know, Minneapolis is really a terrific city. You've got many, many assets here. You've got a lot going on, a lot of citizen participation. But let me tell you something, it's not larger than life. Uh, well, we don't know. We've only been here a few days. We don't know if, if, if Fort Collins is actually larger than life. But there are some qualities about it that we think are very special. There's, there's a sense of personality, identity, and character. Some people call that community DNA. And, and there, there is a uniqueness to that. Um, there's uh, an authenticity. You know who you are. And much of, of what we see in downtown certainly reflects that. Um, so I think we come here, those of us for the first time, with uh, even greater appreciation uh, for what you have here. A second comment uh, is that um, Oftentimes, as when I was head of the International Downtown Association, I would talk with groups about having the appropriate organizational vehicle. And I would ask them, for example, when you're going on vacation, you know, where are you going to the mountains, or are you going to the ocean, or are you going to the Caribbean, and how are you going to get there? Because you can have resources, you can have ideas and plans, and you can have all kinds of things. But if you don't have the right organizational vehicle, you're not getting there. You know, a Schwinn sing, a single speed uh, with balloon tires is great for riding on Mountain Avenue. But if you're going up in the hills, you probably need a black sheep or a Santa Cruz uh, Nomad uh, Carbon, right? Amen. <laughs> so so yeah, part of what we're saying is things are changing. They're changing locally. And you see that with companies like Otterbox. You see that with the growth of CSU. Things are changing regionally. Got this huge new lifestyle center uh, south of town, and things are changing globally. And the global economy has had an impact on everybody, ranging from things like just making it harder to, to, to lend uh, for small businesses. So we've got to keep those things in mind as we look at parking and transportation in, in the context of global, regional, and local change. Um, so um, let's let's get into this here uh, and take a look at, we grouped um, uh, probably 12 pages of observations, our, our so-called brain dump, into nine different categories. And I'll just touch on those very, very quickly. Um, policies, planning, and regulation. Y you folks have done, we think, a terrific job of planning over the years, and it's reflected in the community you have here, and, and we feel you know, very grateful to be here to help you look at uh, your planning process, at your policies and your regulations. But there are some issues there. Okay, okay. Um, there, uh, there, there are organizational issues uh, that uh, I just referred to. Having the right structure, the right organization, the right resources. Um, there's pricing and finance issues. Um, as we look around the country at other cities of this size and we look at the resources that you are able to put toward addressing these looming uh, challenges, uh, we think there's some, some real issues there that we need to make you aware of. Yeah. We are now at 1.30 a.m. 
last night. That's why we have two threes up there. Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I missed that too. <laughs> so that was three, three, three A is business concerns. Uh, we, we had a number of uh, uh, downtown business people meet with us and they were um, both very helpful and uh, at the same time very forceful in terms of their concerns and we listened to those concerns. Some of them even showed up as quotes. Um, the issue of parking operations and management, as Dennis said, uh, is, is a, a core to, to why we're here and we're looking at that very closely. We have some recommendations regarding that. But we also, and uh, we're down to number five, we appreciate what's so important here, uh, the alternative modes of transportation from the Mason Corridor just, just to the really extraordinary number of people who ride bikes. Uh, uh, probably haven't seen that. I, as I said, I grew up in Minneapolis, and I'm even seeing in Minneapolis, I was there in January, and on one day when it was about 10 above, I counted about a dozen people in downtown riding bicycles. So it, it is becoming a real uh, choice for people. Um, the customer experience, um, the customer experience in downtown is wonderful in many ways. We raise the question, does the parking experience measure up to the rest of, of the experience? And after all, Parking is your first experience and your last experience if you come either by car or by bike. Um, quality of life, hard to find a place in the US or anywhere for that matter where quality of life is both better than it is here and where uh, you recognize how, how good it is. The environmental issues, environmental issues are everything from uh, sustainability and all the green things but it also, environment is also kind of the business climate and, and uh, supporting that, jobs, it's all, all of those things. And finally, attitudes and perceptions. Um, these are critically important. Perception is reality in so many ways. And so we really believe that you need to look back at, at, at your community, at yourselves, and kind of examine attitudes and perceptions and are they helpful or not helpful. So, <clears throat> when we took all of those observations, we really um, identified some categories that we thought were big picture ideas, and then these recommendations are in the areas of organization and funding, uh, business and community integration, and we really, um, in more than in a lot of other communities, see, saw and heard from the business community and from residents. Um, alternative modes. This is a community that's very advanced in terms of that in a lot of ways. Policies and regulations, maybe here's an area where you're not so advanced and you need to really look at some of these because they may be impeding your ability to, to compete. Um, improving customer service. Uh, how do you really make a parking system, as I said uh, years ago in one community I work in, how would it feel if it were run by Nordstrom? You know, how do you make it so customer friendly that the parking system really uh, treats people as guests rather than potential violators? And then finally, parking management. All of this is not going to happen unless you have the right vehicle and the right tools. We looked at uh, a number of qualities by which we want to measure these recommendations. And th this is our, our grocery list of things that we think are really important. Is it comprehensive? Does it really take into account not just parking itself, not just on street or uh, off street, but really does it look at the whole picture and integrate that with economic and uh, sustainability issues? Is it strategic, not just tactical? Are we thinking ahead? Um, does it employ common sense? And uh, Dennis, you forgot common sense is two words, but uh, we forgive you again on that one. Worse as we go along. <laughs> If it doesn't meet the common sense test, it's not uh, likely to fly with, with uh, residents and, and voters of uh, Fort Collins. Um, is it data driven? Is, is it evidence based? Uh, can we say we really know that this is what's going on or are we just guessing or is it anecdotal? Um, is it motivating? You know, it's pretty hard to think of parking as inspiring, but when you think of an overall transportation access mobility plan, and you think of what that can mean, parking is personal, all of that is personal. Um, you know, we had a very uh, 
uh, personal comment from this gentleman here in the front about how you know it, it was affecting you, and I remember that very vividly. It is, uh, it's got to be motivating, or else you're not going to reach for the heights. You're just going to incrementally try to fix things. Um, community and self-interest. Where you get things done is where community interest intersects with self-interest. If we don't understand the self-interest of our business people, our downtown residents, our uh, uh, commuters, all of those people, if we don't understand that, we really, it's hard to aggregate and get to community interest. The triple bottom line, you've heard that over and over again, um, very important. The, the system needs to be accountable and transparent. You as a citizen, you as a business person, should be able to know how it works, know where the money's coming from, where it's going to, all of that. There's no reason to be secretive about that. And finally, implementable. If we can't do it, I mean, we can have all the wonderful dreams, but if we can't actually make it happen, then we ought to take it off the table. So we spent, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it looks like organized chaos, and that's about what it is. Uh, and this was probably at about 8 o'clock last night. Uh, we're still working on this. Now we're getting the preliminary recommendations. In the area of policy and regulations, um, we recommend uh, developing parking policies that actually support economic development and neighborhood livability. I will tell you, and Dennis and I in particular can, because we worked together for so long, so many cities, parking policies and regulations either support um, the notion of uh, enforcement or they support the notion of revenue. What we're suggesting here is to let, uh, list, lift it to a new level and look at economic development and neighborhood livability. We think those are the, the ultimate goals to shoot for. <clears throat> so we recommend reevaluating parking requirements and regulations for new development. Should there be no requirements at all? Should there be a minimum, a maximum? Um, that's something we can't tell you right now because that needs further examination in, in what we're doing, but it, it certainly seems to be something that is starting to bubble up and could be one of those mountains out there that you're gonna need your mountain bike for. Um, uh, encouraging interdepartmental coordination to support parking planning and parking policy development. It is a fact that in many, many local governments, there are silos. Everybody know what, what I mean when I say silos? I see a lot of smiles. Jim, you, you kind of have run into a few silos in your life. Um, we think we ought to try very hard to break those silos down and to get a, a lot more uh, communication and coordination uh, between departments. Um, we, we recommend developing parking strategies for the downtown transition area, the area uh, that is starting to look like it wants to be more commercial and less uh, residential. And with any growing downtown, that's going to be a pressure that you'll find around the edges. Um, so the Mason Corridor, the development opportunities in the uh, northern downtown gateway and the river district are all areas where we really need to look at those edges. Uh, in terms of organization and funding, uh, creating a parking organization with a governance board. Here we really get to this idea of having a, a, an organization that is uh, kind of a public-private partnership. It's, it's part of government in that it's managing a public asset, but it has a strong private component in it. And I want to just for a minute turn to, to Ann and ask Ann if she would grab the mic and uh, tell us a little bit about the, the organizational uh, structure and the business involvement in your community. Okay, I'm Ann Guest, and I'm the uh, director of the Missoula Parking Commission. And in 1971, our community and council and mayor developed what we call an enterprise fund. And uh, so that was 40 years ago. And it's considered, a, uh, I guess we can uh, define it as a component unit of the city. And by that, it has its own authority, which means that we can own and buy land, we can issue revenue bonds, and we can run a comprehensive parking program. It is run by a board of directors, um, that are recommended and uh, approved by the council, and they are usually stakeholders of the downtown. 
The important element of this is that we are able to keep our revenue. So all the revenue that's uh, generated through the parking program, through fines, leases, permits, and so forth, we're able to keep within that enterprise fund, build it, and then say in the 40 years that we have managed it, we've been able to purchase 12 off-street lots. We have two garages that are in our name. We're now building a $9.5 million parking structure. We have a, a employees of 11. So we've got a real viable organization, and that's all based on the concept of an enterprise fund. So it really works well for us. So that's just one example. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ann. Um, as, as we go on to the next bullet point then, utilizing and creating additional dedicated funding sources, one of the communities that has done, I think, uh, in my opinion, a very good job of finding funding to build parking structures and infrastructure generally is Boulder. And if you can pass the, mark, uh, the mic back to uh, Molly, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you funded all those uh, sure. structures? Sure. Uh, Molly Winter with the City of Boulder. Actually, um, we have a, a situation that's somewhat similar to Missoula in that in the 1970s, the leaders in Boulder created a general improvement district in the downtown area and also in the um, area adjacent to our university. And its sole purpose was parking and parking related improvements. So again, it was a, um, and in Colorado, it's a general improvement district, which has a um, whole series of state legislation. But the whole idea is that it's a group set up to address, um, address the parking. It has a funding uh, mechanism through property tax. It has a governance board um, that is the city council, but it has an advisory group that, it, that are downtown stakeholders. And so this has been a mechanism for us to build five garages and we have four um, surface lots. I think the other thing um, in Boulder is we took it to a slightly um, higher level in that um, some of the other revenues are on-street um, parking revenues, which we've had on-street parking since 1947, actually similar to Missoula. And so a lot of those revenues are actually reinvested back into the downtown, both in physical improvements, a lot of the um, rehab of our Pearl Street Mall, um, but also we have a very substantial investment in um, travel demand management programs. So part of those parking revenues come back to buy bus passes for our downtown employees. And this is a very um, strategic move. Um, it helps us meet our, um, our transportation goals of reducing our carbon footprint. Um, it's also an employee benefit, but it's also a benefit to the district because it's economically smart in that if we can get our employees not to drive, and for us, parking spaces cost $25,000 at least to build, $500 to operate a year. So if we can buy a $120 bus pass and get 62% of our employees to use alternative modes, it makes sense economically. So again, it's, it's a benefit to the community. It's also a benefit to the whole health and wellness movement that we're all experiencing in our cities. And then it also fits our, our bottom line. Great, thank you. Um, the, the next uh, re recommendation area, number three, is business and community integration. And this really has a couple of components, uh, evaluating the pros and cons of a residential uh, permit zone program. And we actually have uh, a couple of examples. Boulder is one, but uh, Missoula, and I'm going to turn back to you, Anne, for a minute and just tell us a little bit about that program. Well, back in 1986, we had really a difficult situation um, in the neighborhood surrounding the University of Montana. They're adjacent to each other. And the homeowners who lived in old traditional housing sometimes didn't even have driveways or garages when they were built in the 30s and 40s. So they were dependent on their on-street parking, and with the students parking there, they had no access to their own homes. So in cooperation with the university and the homeowners, they established what we call a residential parking permit program, or, or an RPP. And um, as I said, that was in 1986, so it's been going for a long time. Um, they incorporated the Parking Commission to come and enforce the regulations there. Um, so really what it did was create order and a sense of peace and neighborhood to an area that was really chaotic beforehand. 
Um, the permits are very inexpensive, so the home, homeowners can get them easily. They can get visitor permits. We accommodate businesses, churches, daycares, sororities, fraternities, all within that area. I think it's run very equitably, and really today, those naysayers that were really opposed to it from the beginning all agree that it really has been a very effective program and has worked very well for both the university and the city. Thank you, Ann. Um, would you leave the mic over there? Because I'm going to turn to Eric next. Um, in this whole area of business and community integration, one of the great difficulties is uh, taking on a, a difficult task and actually listening to the business community and local residents. And so in terms of public-private partnerships for parking, there's other things we can talk about uh, a little bit later, but what I'd like to have Eric talk about right now is how he created a kind of public-private partnership to reintroduce on-street on uh, paid parking. Eric, just uh, a quick description. Yeah, we, uh, we confronted a situation uh, in Tacoma. We did not have uh, on-street parking, paid on-street parking, hadn't for 40 years, uh, and then began to experience um, situations where the lack of parking was affecting the viability of businesses. In fact, customers weren't coming to those businesses because they couldn't get there. Uh, and they, it was an unfortunate fact, but they were, weren't willing to walk the extra couple of blocks that it took to get there, and so they simply go somewhere else. Um, we also had uh, a whole other set of, uh, of issues that came up. The city government couldn't solve those by itself, uh, tried to and ran into a very strong negative reaction from the business community. Uh, and after uh, a number of years, began a conversation. And uh, the conversation with the business community, with the residents of downtown, uh, with really anybody that wanted to attend the conversation, uh, and had a three-year period where those conversations took place. And as a result of that, uh, coming out of that set of conversations, the people that were interested sort of stuck with it and became part of the recommending body and uh, largely made up of business people that were in the downtown area. And they recommended to the council that we go to uh, paid on street parking and that it be market-based. It was critical for them that it be treated like an, uh, a commodity and that it was uh, a matter of managing the inventory, same as they manage in their, in their own stores. Uh, and that we go forward and that we manage it that way and that we manage it by the marketplace. If we had a a block where no one shows up, uh, then in point of fact, there's no need to charge for parking on that block. If you have a block where everybody shows up and you simply can't get a parking space, then they established a measure of 15% vacancy rate. And if you're at 15%, so you've got one or, or two spaces all the time, then the market, you're right at market. So it wasn't a political decision and it wasn't an administrative decision. It was in fact a market decision uh, that was established by the business owners themselves. And with their, not only their advice, but quite honestly, with their control of the issue, uh, we then went forward and were able to uh, put the parking in place. One other thing I would say about it is, none of us ever thought we had the answer. Uh, even after we went forward with it, it is constantly changing, we're constantly adjusting it, and the business people have uh, control over it to uh, make sure that that change takes place in a way that benefits their businesses. Just like they have to change their inventory in their, in their businesses from time to time or how they manage it, parking's the same way, and you have to change the way you manage it from time to time. Great, Eric. Um, and, and I want to be clear, and we'll be talking about this a little later in the presentation, uh, what we, we are not recommending that you go out and put in a, a whole bank of uh, uh, pay stations or meters or whatever right now, but we are saying that that is a tool and a very important tool in managing downtown and for business people to come ahead and say this is something we want to do. I think that's that's an interesting perspective. Uh, the, the last bullet here, I want to make a quick comment and say how lucky you are and you all know it that you have Colorado State University right on the edge of, of downtown. Um, the best small cities like uh, F Fort Collins that I've seen. If I had to tell you my 10 favorite cities, and this would be one of them, they almost all have a, a university or college right on the edge or even in downtown. So that's such an asset 
and maybe an underutilized asset in a lot of ways, but it also creates parking impacts, and we heard that from a number of you. Um, you have a large employer that's established uh, uh, on uh, Meldrum, and that employer is working very hard to be a good neighbor. We heard from that, but that is also creating parking impacts over in that area. So this is part of that mountain range that's sitting just out there, and uh, one that you're going to have to climb. Uh, CSU is going to grow. We know that. Uh, if you want other other uh, uh, corporations like uh, OtterBox, and I'll tell you, every community that I go to would love to have an OtterBox, not only in it, but in downtown. Uh, if you want those things to happen, then you really have to get out in front and look at parking impacts. Now we get to parking management uh, in terms of our recommendation. And uh, we, as, as Eric pointed out, you need to evaluate the pros and cons of paid on-street parking very seriously and look at it as a business issue and an economic issue as well as kind of the culture of the community. You need to take all those things in, into uh, account. Um, but if you decide to go in that direction, we recommend a governance board made up of stakeholders. Um, and, and we suggest maybe a way of approaching this is to look at two things. Some kind of a pilot program, and that's been tried in some places with, with real success, and also free time. I mean, um, one of the most popular programs we see in so many communities where there is paid parking on street is where there's some kind of free time on the front end. If you're just going to run in to grab a sandwich or run in to, uh, to pick up some dry cleaning, in one community, there's a little blue button you can push on the parking meter and it gives you a half an hour of free time. So those are things that can really make these programs work if you choose to go in that direction. Um, a second thing that we think is, is really important is to work with all employers, and that includes businesses, but it also includes city government, county government, in terms of reducing on-street parking by employees. Even if you didn't have uh, paid parking on street, which is a good way to manage on street, um, but you may not decide to do that. Uh, you do want to tackle this problem because we heard from so many people that employee parking is an issue, and we mentioned that before. And it's an issue not only through the week, it's also a week, an issue on Saturdays. What happens on Saturdays, we were told, is that employees come in at uh, 8 or so in the morning before the stores open up. And by 9 o'clock, a lot of the choice parking spaces are taken. So that's, that's really an issue that we recommend you look at. Um, in terms of alternate uh, modes of transportation, you all, again, are doing a terrific job in so many ways, both with, the, uh, uh, with your terrific bike program and with your um, BRT. Um, but all those things need to be integrated into an access management strategy. And here we're pointedly not saying a parking management strategy, but access management strategy that includes parking, but also transit, bikes, and pedestrian travel. Um, we heard from several people, and we heard some very avid bikers, uh, expand the uh, covered and uncovered bike parking options based on demand. So that's something that I think, uh, you know, being on the cutting edge as you are, you need to kind of look at that and uh, test it out. And again, that gets back to, to being data-based and, and evidence-based. Um, and uh, developing a travel demand management strategy in conjunction with the, the Mason Corridor project. Again, you know, this is kind of one of those big things that could be in many ways a game changer for you. Got to get out in front of it. Customer experience. Um, here, before we start on the list, I really want to talk or, uh, to turn over for just a few minutes to Vanessa because her organization um, was able to contract with the city government to take over and manage what was really a, a, an unpopular and uh, um, underutilized parking system that had a lot of problems. And through all of the things they're doing, new, new perspectives on management, new ways of managing, putting in new, new services and so forth. They've been really able to turn that system around. So Vanessa, if you would tell us a little bit about that. 
Thanks, Dave. Good morning. I'm a little stuffed up, so I apologize. I'll try and project. But um, we actually, um, you know, um, Molly and Ann have been um, doing this for a long time. They've got really terrific programs, and I'm kind of the, the new kid on the block, and I think Cedar Rapids is too, because we just went through a process similar to this, our own parking strategic planning process in late 2009, early 2010. So right now I'm actually living um, the process that will result when you guys get your final report and moving into those phases of implementation. And it was a realization in our community that downtown in the surrounding areas could simply just no longer, we couldn't afford to ignore parking anymore and just hope that it would work out. Um, as some of you may know, we, we faced a devastating flood in 2008, and over the next several years, um, thankfully we're getting back on our feet, but we're looking at about three quarters of a billion with a B dollars invested, both public and private, in our downtown. And we knew that we needed to make sure that we got out ahead of that and made sure that we had the critical pieces of infrastructure, um, one of which is parking, to make sure that we were able to support all the new development that was happening um, in our downtown. And so. One of the, the things that came from our strategic planning was a, a real game-changing moment for us. We were doing things uh, okay, but we really needed something to get us to the next level. Um, and that really, um, I think, hinged on getting the people that really um, rely on parking management, the downtown business and property owners, involved in the process because they really needed to be the champions of um, of the parking system and its revitalization. And so we worked for about a year with the city to um, move management of our parking system both on and off street and enforcement um, underneath the downtown association. And what this allowed us to do is have a, um, you know, a governance board that was made up of stakeholders that were really invested in the area and they were nimble and they were small and they could focus just on parking. Your city is doing a great job, but they've got a lot of stuff on their plate. And you know, we always kind of joke, parking's got to be someone's top priority. But it maybe maybe it's not always the city's. But the city is a great partner um, because you can't just afford to ignore parking. So making that tra transition in April of this year really allowed us to hit the ground running and start to make some of those big improvements. Um, one of which is customer service. It's my strong belief, and this really came out in our stakeholder interviews. I did a similar process in Cedar Rapids. Um, that we weren't just talking about parking. We were talking about the first impression that someone had and their last impression. We were talking about part of the downtown experience. If someone is thinking about going downtown and has a negative feeling already, you know, it's going to taint the way that they experience when they get downtown. And we wanted to really make it um, an experience enhancer and, and, and not just make it something that everyone was dreading. And so we've done that in a variety of different ways. Um, customer service was a really big thing. Um, even though we did shift the management over to the downtown association, we brought on um, existing city staff. And so really pushing the staff to the forefront and really giving them a voice because they are down there as our downtown customer ambassadors. They've got packs that have downtown maps and information. And they're out there on the street helping um, our customers interact with, uh, we're installing new pay stations actually in, in a couple of weeks, helping people interact with the new technology, providing them with information, talking to people, because they're a lot of times the first people that um, customers are going to interact with. So we wanted to really push them to the front as our parking professionals. Um, you know, driving a really customer service new branding, Park Cedar Rapids, with a new website. So if people are at home, they can go online and figure out where they're going to park, how much it's going to be, very easy, print it off. And so when they're downtown, they know exactly where they're going to go. It's a really, really big part of it. So all these different components for us really focus around the overall customer experience. Because for our community, we're not just talking about parking. We're talking about economic development. And we know if we're going to be able to sustain three quarters of a billion dollars in investment we better get off the dime and start working on some of these really critical infrastructure pieces. So, yeah. Thanks a lot, yeah. Vanessa. Um, I'm going to move through the rest of these quickly because I do want to get to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, but I do want to touch on a couple of things. Marketing the benefits of off-street parking. One of the things that people hate most about uh, paid parking is getting a ticket. And uh, in, in this town, you don't even have paid parking, and you can still get a ticket. So uh, to the degree that we can uh, move people, uh, uh, you know, if they're going to be here for four hours or five hours right now, if we can get them to a, a safe, secure, and pleasant experience in a parking garage, we want to do that. And by the way, I just want to say, we met with the parking enforcement officers and, and the people from parking enforcement, 
And they are really uh, downtown ambassadors in a lot of ways. They do a lot of other things besides uh, writing tickets. And Doug, uh, you and your colleagues need to get a pat on the back for, for the good work you do. Um, effectively, integrating parking into the wayfinding system, uh, Dennis talked about that, so I'm not going to go dwell on that. Uh, that also implies a need for a parking system brand identity and communication strategy. You want to put a friendly face on things. Now, we changed the, uh, the name when I was in one community to, just to Auto Park, and we uh, changed the, the, the citations, the parking tickets, to, we called them invoices. Um, people seem to like that better. So it's all kind of, you know, looking at things differently and finally leveraging new technology. You know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to just ha pull up on your iPhone and look at where the 17 uh, vacant spaces are in downtown? Or if you do have a, a pay station, being able to go on your cell phone and have uh, 15 minutes or a half hour added to your time. There's so much new technology out there that's really changed the whole customer experience. So finally, we kind of asked ourselves, if we, we the city of Fort Collins, are successful, what would this look like? What would it feel like? Um, first of all, we really recommend and we think you can achieve a best-in-class transportation access and parking system that has the tools sufficient not only for today, and I want, you're going to hear us say this over and again, but to meet future needs. You're, you're heading off into those mountain trails now, and you really need to think about how do you get up that, that mountain that's just around the corner. Secondly, and very important, the business community and the city will, will engage collaboratively in uh, productive ways and be willing uh, to support each other and be partners. Um, nothing of great significance happens in our cities today without public-private partnerships. It's the way of doing business. Um, the local community will continue uh, and extend its use of downtown and local businesses, and local businesses will flourish. We want to see successful businesses in downtown. We want those of you who are in the business community here to succeed, to be uh, profitable, and to create jobs for, for um, people from Fort Collins. Uh, the magic of this town needs to be preserved and enhanced. That cannot be lost. Too many uh, towns, even college towns, have seen the mix either go from a lot of independent uh, merchants to a lot of chains. And we don't think that's a good thing. That balance is really important. We also, you know, really think that uh, um, there's a lot of other elements of that magic that you need to understand and continue to work to preserve and enhance. Uh, downtown employees, visitors, and restaurants should find access, transportation, and parking to be user-friendly and understandable. Um, we thought one of the things that, uh, you know, when you get your first uh, parking ticket and it's a, a free ticket, there's a yellow card in there. And, uh, too much information to put on a sign, but if you read that, it really does help you to understand how to access parking in downtown. Expanding on those ideas is important. And finally, the parking program should be comprehensive, strategic, and based on common sense. Um, that's what we're recommending. That's what we found. We couldn't have done it without you. And uh, now it's your turn. Tell us. Let's start. Go ahead. Well, first of all, I want to repeat my thanks, okay, so that it can be heard to the city of Fort Collins and the panel. And a um, question about experience of panel in your communities with e-bikes and fixed rail versus buses on the intermodal transition. And um, I, I, I've liked what you've said on parking meters. Is it possible with the technology that you can have like graduated, say the first two hours, like a, a, a dollar, and then each hour after that for a, for a dollar? So those are my three questions. Um, first on the e-bikes, has anybody had a, a experience with e-bikes? I uh, um, I used to live in Pittsburgh, and uh, up, we have the big Mount Washington right outside of downtown, right at the top. There's a bike shop, and they are selling uh, e-bikes. So uh, <laughs> you can kind of—they're doing very well. 
Um, but uh, I, I haven't uh, otherwise run into to that one. Um, in terms of the technology, Dennis, do you want to answer the? Sure. Uh, well, for us, I think this is one of the more exciting areas because there are so many options and so much flexibility that we didn't have even a couple of years ago. But if it was the new meters, you could actually have the first two hours very inexpensive uh, and eliminate time limits, perhaps, but ramp up the cost if you want to stay past those initial two hours to give people that want to spend more time shopping that option. If you paid by cell phone with those new meters, you can get a text message that says your meter's about to expire. Would you like to add more time? I mean, that's a great way to keep people shopping and let's not end the experience just because, oh my God, my meter's gonna expire. If we can keep them going, the longer the stay in downtown, the more money they're gonna spend in downtown. In Boise, when we introduced the first hour free in the garages and the 20 minutes free on the street, over the four year period from the time we implemented that, the transient parking length of stay went from 2.1 hours to 3.56 hours. And in four years, downtown sales tax revenues doubled. That's success in my book, so. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Yes. In terms of uh, fixed rail, we uh, oh, in Tacoma, we have a, um, what we call the link. It's a, a light rail um, cross between a light rail system and a, and a uh, tram system. And it's been in place for about 10 years and it runs from uh, the railroad station uh, that connects us with Seattle and, uh, and almost everybody else uh, down to the middle of downtown. It has served as um, essentially a, a pilot project for us and the council uh, is considering along with the community the extension of that into a citywide uh, um, tram uh, or uh, um, streetcar system uh, and one of the interesting things about it is is that we pulled out a we pulled out a drawing of the streetcar system in 1946 and it is almost exactly the same <laughs> as the streetcar system that is currently being planned uh, a lot of us think we probably shouldn't have pulled the rails out when we, when we <laughs> did but uh, it very successful very well received uh, but it is only a part of the system. We also use bus rapid transit, uh, uh, bicycles, a whole variety of different uh, ways for people to get from one place to another. Uh, and as they grow and people become uh, reliant on them, they become more and more successful. I was at a conference the other day, by the way, and heard that there are 45 cities currently looking at, uh, at um, streetcars, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, 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 an e probably an equal number of cities or more that are looking at rubber tire trolley systems, uh, circulator systems, shuttle bus systems. So really creating a, a network that is beginning to uh, make it a lot easier to, to, to have access to our downtowns. You got a question in the back there, can, uh, Timothy, can you? Well, I think you may have just answered it, but it had to do with the downstream flow of, of transportation. Mm -hmm. You drive in, you bus in, however you get to the city, you park. Now you got to go somewhere. And you've talked about wayfinding, and you've mentioned our alleyways, which is quite an achievement for us. But what other systems are out there to help people get from that parking structure to where they need to go within the, within the town? Mm -hmm. I've heard things said, and somebody mentioned about walking two blocks. You walk a quarter of a mile to a Walmart store because you can see this, the door, but you won't walk around the corner to a downtown street because you can't see it. So what sort of extenders of pedestrian activities or, or other streetcars or whatever tend to work in, in doing that? Well, well, one of the comments I would make, and uh, we heard it uh, more than once, in fact, frequently, was your comment about being unwilling to walk a couple blocks. And uh, somebody said, you guys are just spoiled. But uh, um, you are um, certainly uh, in a situ situation here where you have a very walkable downtown. And, uh, you know, um, uh, there was a, a woman, I, I think her name was Kathleen, who sat back here and said, let's just get out. We can walk three blocks. We can walk four blocks. Um, the weather here is also pretty good, and it permits walking uh, um, most of the year. Uh, so um, I think uh, some of the other things, just, just one thing that I heard that I thought was really good is the city here has, um, in their, their pool of vehicles, they have a number of bikes. 
And, and uh, employees like Timothy, if they have to go someplace during the day, can leave their car parked and take a bike. Uh, and I think that's one good way of, of circulating. Dennis, have you seen someone? I've got several, and I'm sure panelists have some. Community bike share programs where you can pick up a bike here and drop it anywhere else at any other station is really catching on. Mm -hmm. And even in communities like Fort Collins where they say everybody's already got a bike, how much more market is there? That was the question they had in D.C. They just installed the program and in the first year they had 80,000 new customers that didn't own their own bikes and participated and it's growing like this. Um, I've seen some really cool, I mean you've got, your pedestrian landscaping is just one of those things that can make the walking really attractive and you don't realize how far you're walking. You've done a great job of that already. Uh, a lot of places are doing, uh, you know how you've got your dismount zones on the sidewalk? A lot of places are using those as sort of a walking tour of interesting and historical things. So if you see what it is and you know that there's 20 more of those things, you kind of want to do the circuit and see what all the interesting things are around the downtown. Uh, Mesa's connecting uh, areas with public art and kind of doing a little public art tour. That just gets people going. And the last thing I want to throw out is a new concept that's growing, the centralized valet. If you come downtown, and you want to pull up on at a valet station right in front of uh, a store and drop your car and just start shopping and walking and dining and there may be four of these stations throughout the downtown you can pick your car up and have the car brought back to any station you don't have to walk all the way back and that's an interesting concept <laughs> molly's going Those are great ideas, and particularly the uh, bike share. We just were fortunate to have Beak Cycle that um, was in Denver, uh, came to Denver with the Democratic Convention, is now in Boulder, and we're looking at that. And it's, I think for us, it was kind of like, why would this work? We're such a big uh, bicycling community, but it's amazing um, how successful it's been, and it's a great thing for um, tourists. But a couple of other things, um, and it has to do with your planning regulations and your use of the public right-of-way, and that is having active pedestrian uses on the street and allowing for all your great, um, the patio extensions and how you've used the public right-of-way for seating areas, which I think are great. And then lastly, what's so important is the partnership with your DBA because they put out so many, so much information on their website, um, the maps, um, all of the all, all of the different now apps that you can get um, about how you uh, walk around downtown or you can put your app up at a building and it gives you some interesting information. So I think weaving all of those things together and that's what makes a really rich community or how all those things work together and you are doing such a fantastic job. So as you're looking at extending the downtown to the north, those are all things that I'm sure are already in the in the planning process, how you use the public right of way, how you use the private buildings and the uses along the street. One, one other comment that I would make, um, and it's a little bit up, but I think it pertains is uh, uh, some towns like this one have um, heavy rail that runs through the middle of the town 40 times a day, and or however many it is. Um, and uh, Cedar Rapids uh, had the same issue, um, and what they chose to do was to make lemons or lemonade out of lemons. They, they created a linear park along the, uh, the railway line, and uh, if you think about how you're going to connect to the new museum up there, you kind of got a dead space in there. Maybe a linear park along the railroad tracks might be one way to do that. It really, uh, I've seen people in Cedar Rapids come down and eat their lunch just to walk the, watch the trains go by. So uh, <laughs> anyway, that's I, I got one more thing I got to tell you because I've never seen this before and it really blew my socks off. You, Molly was talking about the mobile apps. I mean, you can you can actually find the parking on the mobile apps, but they were using the mobile apps as part of this kind of walking tour or art tour or historic mm -hmm. tour. And as you got, you, you pull up the app and it, it introduces you to what you're what you're going to see and how to, what the route is. But as you got to each of the places, it would actually play you a little tape or description mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. based because it knew where you were based on your the Wi-Fi and the GPS yes. so it gave you a, a, a walking tour with real information and just like being in a museum and going from painting to painting to painting and hearing about the artists mm -hmm. I thought that was fabulous another question or comment well yes sir uh, David? Um, well first of all I want to sort of echo the comment I want to echo 
echo the comment that Mel shared, and thank you for mm -hmm. coming to Fort Collins and, and giving us your outside, independent, objective advice. And one of the things we talked about at dinner is, um, please don't be shy about telling us what you think we can be doing to get from really good to great. Mm -hmm. So um, even if you don't think we're going to like it, <laughs> I think that's really important. That's the value of bringing a team like you in. So um, thanks for that. I'm sort of curious. Um, you mentioned department silos, mm -hmm. and um, not to air our dirty laundry here, but we're one big happy community and believe in transparency. <laughs> what are some of those things that you saw? And then I have a follow-up question. Well, uh, first let me say that um, that was uh, the silo uh, comment was something we heard from both inside and outside from people we met with. Um, I think. Dennis, you've been here a little bit longer than I have, and I, I wonder if you could speak with a little more experience to, to that issue. Well, I actually don't perceive that to be a huge issue, but I do think that there are, it's an opportunity to do it even better as we develop new uh, and look at parking requirements and zoning issues and code issues and code compliance issues and enforcement issues going down the road, a better linkage internally so that the other departments that are really not parking, but they have parking impacts, understand parking better, and that parking understands their roles better. It's not that we saw that as a horrible dysfunction, but as an opportunity for improvement. And I think, as you've identified it, that can be real problematic in communities. So linking planning and other uh, elements to parking and parking operations and management uh, is just an opportunity for improvement. Molly? Um, I, I'd like to speak to this on a couple levels. One, um, being the parking manager in a city, uh, very much like Randy, um, I, I think it's, um, from my perspective, it's constantly working with my fellow employees to think about parking from the beginning. Um, because it's a number of times, my experience has been, we'll be working down a, you know, there'll be a project going on, and they'll get to a point and they say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do about parking? So, and then they come in and, you know, a certain way it's like, oh, I'm coming in and, you know, saving the day. But it's not a, it's not a great, great way to a, have a comprehensive solution. So I think it's just something in um, local governments that people just, it isn't on top of mind. So I think things we can do um, to have the parking folks at the table from the beginning um, will just help people see things from a different perspective. And then I also put on my hat as a board member of the International Parking Institute. And this is, a, uh, this is not anything to do with Fort Collins or Boulder. I think this is a, a national issue, and it's not just in local governments. It's really um, having parking at the table from the beginning. You talk about public-private partnerships. Um, getting, uh, getting, you know, parking commissions, getting parking departments there um, in the very beginning stages because we are, um, we have economic resources. Um, we understand a lot of the dynamics um, that are involved. So, um, Darren, it's, it's really, you know, from a, both a national perspective um, and a local perspective just to get um, parking and other access management um, um, aspects at the table early on just helps with a more comprehensive uh, right. solution. I, um, I, I'm on, uh, I'm a former board member of the Res Responsible Hospitality Institute. It's an uh, organization that really looks at the nighttime economy and sale of alcoholic beverages and that sort of thing. And one of the things that they've done very effectively, Darren, is they've um, brought together people in city government who normally just don't talk to one another. Uh, public works, police, code, um, uh, the, you know, people planning, uh, whole fire, a uh, whole range of people. Because we're seeing them, some things happen, maybe not in Fort Collins yet, but it could be coming. One of the things that's happening in a lot of college towns is parking garages are becoming the nightclub for underage drinking. And I don't know if it's happening here or, you know, it may be just starting or it may not be. But we're seeing a lot of towns is the kids are showing up and they all get together in their cars and, uh, you know, they're 18 years old and somehow they've been able to acquire alcohol and they're, uh, they're turning the parking garages into party, party zones. So um, looking at things in terms of 
the goals you want to achieve and the, the issues that you're addressing rather than in terms of departmental and getting uh, departments that normally don't work together, uh, it may be, it may be helpful. I'd like to give one specific example of what Molly said about bringing parking in earlier into the discussion, because a lot of times we feel like we're the last ones to know. <laughs> That's partly our own fault, but a great example, just as an illustration, was uh, there was a program, this isn't really about interdepartmental, I mean, uh, city stuff, but there was a university that was building a new parking structure, and the design team was put together, uh, and the parking people were really prepared. They knew what they wanted from an operational point of view and from a technology point of view. Uh, but they weren't brought in until like the, normally there's, a, there's concept development then design development phase. They weren't brought in until design development. And, and basically what, what they were told when they said, when they look at the plans from the architect and said, well, here's where we put your parking booth. They said, we don't want a parking booth. We can be much more efficient with pay on foot. We've got all this new technology outlined. This is our new standard. Oh, well, we can't change the design now. We've already got the shear walls placed. You know, we just can't go back. And that was a huge mistake. But the value that could have been brought to that institution in terms of cost savings operationally long term was just missed in that particular case. I just want to jump in. I don't want to be repetitive, but um, since we've taken over the parking system and everyone knows who the contact person is, I think prior to parking is a, so uh, such a multifaceted thing. D development deals would come up, or questions would come up, or city planning would come up, and, and no one knew who to call. People would not be connecting with the right people, so it's made a huge difference for us because people now know who to get in contact with. And um, what we were, and I know our property owners and the downtown association and our business owners were really tired of hearing, oh, this development went somewhere else because of parking. But no one had ever asked the folks working on parking if they could help in advance. And so these past six months, um, I know that I've seen a significant change in just my relationships with the different city departments that I work with because they know if something comes across their desk that's related to parking, they give me a call and give me a heads up first. So we can start having that conversation, like Molly said, right at the beginning. Um, and I think we've um, alleviated a lot of the issues that, that, that we'd seen before with, um, you know, we just hear about it, oh, so-and-so decided not to come downtown because of parking. Do they want to ask the parking department? It's, it's really critical that you get these professionals in and at the table right away because they can help you come up with solutions, what they do every day. So I think that um, we've seen a significant change in Cedar Rapids and just attitudes um, and just an interdepartmental, um, you know, working together and collaboration. So. My, um, and, and oh. maybe, maybe one final thought, Darren. Um, when when uh, I did what uh, with Vanessa described in, in another town, um, one of the things, and it was just sort of a off the top of my head idea, I said to our city manager who I work very closely with, I said, you know, maybe we really don't have a feel for what's going on on the street. Why don't we go out for a half a day and walk with the uh, enforcement officer and see what he or she sees? I mean, really get down on the street or, or you know, sit in a booth or do, do something like that. Um, it was revealing and it helped to kind of integrate the, the, the our parking folks into the other things they needed to be aware of as well as uh, becoming aware of, of their issues. Well, I appreciate the responses. I, I also want to say I, I really I like the way in which you described the Nordstrom quality customer service and if mm -hmm. Nordstrom were running this and I do that's not a criticism of our current leadership or our current staff. I think our folks do a great job at that. I, I had an interaction yesterday not involving a ticket but a very positive interaction with um, the team of folks here, and so I'm. I'm not. I think it's about thinking about how to get how to get better. Not that there's a criticism of where we are right. now. Right. The the only other thing I have is I would ask that. Um, first of all, I think this local government has shown that we're open to alternative government governance structures, um, authorities, whether it's for a library, whether it's for a museum of discovery, or on and on and on. But I think that um, it's really really important to. Um, understand what the long-term objectives are and and um, that we're not trying to fix something that at least from my I perceive I don't feel like parking in Fort Collins is broken mm -hmm. this whole conversation is about how we prepare for the future mm -hmm. and I know that governance is something that you know Randy's been been talking about and we have for some time <clears throat> but not resourcing it but I think 
So I think there's an openness to that, but I think there's there will be great rigor and diligence sort of applied to why. What are we trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. What will that alternative governance structure allow us or enable us to do? And so as you're packing up and leaving, I know some of you aren't, you're staying, but, and I don't mean, I mean that in the positive sense, Eric. Um, and Eric didn't, Eric didn't say, he's a, he's a highly regarded um, former city manager. He was a city manager of Tacoma and, and Des Moines, Iowa, I believe, and he's, he's a great guy. We're lucky to have him and everyone else here. But as you're leaving, if you would, or as you're developing your report, is if you would leave us with tangible examples and maybe mm -hmm. even contacts, where either parking managers, which Randy probably has a lot of examples, or city managers, or council members, or mayors, or business owners, can make contacts and, and find out what, you know, um, that, that would be very helpful. Because I promise you, we will look at this stuff with great rigor, um, but not with a predetermined outcome that we're going to do it. But if it's the right tool for us, then then I, I think you make a compelling argument, and I think our elected officials are always open to that. But um, anyway, that would be very helpful. I appreciate you guys very much um, and your work and your your uh, your commitment to Fort Collins. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's go there, and then we'll come over there. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Astrid, and I am a landlord of uh, 44 residential units in commercial downtown mm -hmm. and seven shops and of course pay my taxes for both and I'm aware of the issues for both the residents and the shops as far as having parking available. Mm -hmm. um, several things and this has been ongoing for since 2004 so I'm uh, I like the idea of following the parking folks and maybe um, talk to landlords that have residential units downtown. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of landlords that have five or ten and that the elephant sleeping in this room <laughs> is not employees parking Saturday morning, but it is our residents. I believe that they get the spaces at one point or another. Um, perhaps 15% uh, might be employees and 15% might be people that were not able to drive themselves home mm -hmm. from the night before, but I really believe that there is um, some 150 to 200 residents downtown in historical buildings, 100 years old, on a lot line, and that there has been no catch up or strategic plan for them. And as we look at, um, you know, enforcing parking on weekends and evenings, I think all of a sudden that group will be coming forward. So I just want to announce that I believe they're all there and, uh, you know, to count them. Thank you. Thank you, and um, we not only uh, recall your um, comments in one of the earlier meetings, but we had a lot of discussion, and I think just to sort of summarize, in a situation like you're in, there is no silver bullet. It really does require comprehensive, strategic, and common sense approaches, because as you said, you know, you're dealing with people who generally are lower income, who may, um, really need that car to get to work and back. I mean, you know, it's not an option for them, uh, depending on where they work. Uh, so th there's no, I think, one thing that's going to work. It's three things or four things that are really going to help. And, and hopefully, as, as the study progresses, we're going to look at that issue, because we do need to have affordable housing in close proximity to downtown. And it's better if people can walk to work and don't need a car. But um, you know, those are all issues that we're going to we're going to be looking at, and thank you. And uh, I saw, yes? Sure. Well, good morning. My name is Al Dunton, and I met you uh, last Monday. Right. And I want to echo what Darren said in the sense of uh, uh, overall, uh, as I said, I travel extensively and compared to many other cities, large and small. And uh, of course, we all like to compare ourselves to Boulder. Uh, we really don't have a parking problem compared to other areas. But there were many little things identified in both of those sessions that uh, you only referenced a few of them. Mm -hmm. For example, extending the enforcement of the two-hour parking into the evenings, possibly Saturday, mm -hmm. et cetera. And one of the issues that uh, I raised, and there was some discussion about, and the comments were that generally the parking garages were underutilized, and I tried to dispel 
that uh, uh, myth, uh, if you will, followed up with a little more research, and I did not see you address that at all in any of your uh, bullet points or your comments, and hope that it is included in the things that you yes. go through. We've had a problem for years, ever since the parking garages have been built. In the perception of people coming in to use those parking garages, that want to shop downtown. And remember, I preface my comments not only as a downtown resident, but a business owner, and especially retail businesses. And once you drive into those after the city and county employees have filled up the more desirable spaces, and you may do that once or twice, but we hear comments all the time, I'm not gonna drive up three or four or five levels or all the way to the fifth level on the roof and park and where are, who are all those people that are parking? Well, more, mo many of them are city and county employees. And one of the things as we've gone through parking over the years that has been suggested that has never been followed up on is that if you're going to pay and subsidize parking for city and county employees, you force them to the least desirable places on the roof or to outlying lots and open up the spaces that are considered, quote, more desirable at the lower levels for the people that are coming in on a short-term basis. And this has been a continuing problem. I can't tell you how many people have come into our store and said, you know, I did that once, but I won't do it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I have to go all the way to the fifth level or the roof of either garage to find a spot, I'm not gonna use the garage during the day. And those, lo those garages are not underutilized during the most important shopping hours of from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. would coincide to the city employees. Likewise, the, um, uh, I'm not sure I want to say it. I'll, pa I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Al. And, and, and I should say thank you for your, your uh, comments uh, in meeting on Monday, too. Um, we have six very ferocious note takers here and we probably could have given you another six or eight uh, slides with observations. And, and uh, I think we all remember, remember that one. Um, and we, uh, I am sure as we look at supply and demand and we look at these other issues, that that one is gonna be one we, we look at. And I think um, one of the things that we talked about, and it probably didn't get in the overall recommendations, was the idea that uh, the city does need to look at maybe a, a, a comprehensive plan for its own employees. Um, they're doing some things very well, but there are others we met with employees and they talked about their parking issues and we talked with other people who are finding you know, city employees as you do parking places where they'd like to park. So there's a lot of issues. Um, and I, I guess I would say two things real quick. One is um, those are issues that need to be attended to and number two, uh, I don't personally think that a city employee should be either penalized or benefited ne necessarily. I mean, we, we don't want to kick them out of downtown, let's say, and make them uh, park somewhere else just because they're city employees, because some of them do need their cars and need to move around. I, wanna, I just want to say, Al, that I don't think we've expressed something that's very, very, very important, I think, for all of us. <laughs> and that is, you know, things are working well right now but you're on the verge of not having enough capacity if a couple of things happen another otter box if there is another otter box but you know if something of that magnitude hits downtown all of a sudden it's not okay anymore it's oh my god kind of a thing uh, the next level of that is going to be looking at how we prioritize the parking allocation and the resources we already have and managing the resources absolutely as effectively as possible but also starting that look at how are we going to plan what are we going to be doing in terms of planning for the future how are we going to fund that that comment that parking is a giant unfunded liability we think is probably the most critical uh, element that we're going to be looking at going forward and there's a lot a lot of research being done data has already been collected analysis is just starting on all of the real supply demand issues That'll be a major focus going forward, and your comments are not lost on us. Jeff? Earlier, uh, you mentioned about dealing with peripheries and having a 
uh, peripheral, uh, a strategy for peripheral properties. Right. I would throw into that mix not only a horizontal peripheral uh -huh. property, but also <laughs> vertical. Okay. okay. And uh, I've been annoying people over the years by saying that the two things that people on the Front Range, and that includes Fort Collins, the two things they hate with equal intensity are density and sprawl. And uh, the, and it's, and, and I think it's true. Is, is that true, Molly? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, and then it's tough to tease out a land use policy based on uh, that outlook. And parking is an important part of a land use policy. So with my witty preamble, I'm going to ask um, uh, two questions. What kind of effect do you see, uh, or how ha have you seen good examples of out, uh, uh, out of downtown parking, remote parking, with reliable shuttles to bring people downtown and maybe with using the parking lot as land banking if a parking space costs 25,000 bucks and up uh, maybe it's cheaper to run a, a, a shuttle of some sort and then the other is vertically have you how have you seen public parking integrated with private parking for a hotel or a something other uh, other kind of retail business uh, I'll take a first stab at that because I think you, you really hit another nail on the head here in terms of looking forward for the future there are several things going on all the investment in the Mason corridor and the TOD the transit oriented development uh, that's envisioned for that uh, Parking is one of those things that's going to either make or break that. Either we have a policy or a, a way to incentivize structured parking to get the development to the level of density that's going to let you achieve the full potential of those areas, or that potential may get squandered if we don't have an investment strategy for that. And in terms of public-private downtown, uh, another concept that we've seen very effective is where the city partners with developers who have a plan. They have a mixed-use development. For example, they want to put in, maybe that requires 300 spaces. <clears throat> but the city sees a need for not one big parking structure here, but that parking structure is sort of 200 spaces here, 200 spaces there, as part of those new development projects. So the developer has his private parking. The city invests 250 spaces in that structure. They both share the infrastructure costs stair towers, foundations, all that kind of thing. So it's a win-win from that point of view. But ultimately, the city has a better distributed public parking system to promote adaptive reuse and infill uh, throughout the downtown and really balance out the park public parking elements. And that does, both it gives you a better parking system, uh, but it also gives you, it incentivizes those development projects to actually go forward. Shared parking with a hotel is a great opportunity and should be promoted at every every turn anything else from um, I need to transition for just a minute our panel needs to get their bags packed they need to get to the airport we need we need to wrap this up <laughs> uh, this has been great but let me emphasize that the conversation does not end here uh, we're going to continue to process what we've heard today we're going to continue with the parking plan I would like to point out that on the flip chart up here at the front of the room is my name, my email address, my phone number, as well as Timothy's. And if you didn't get a chance to speak today, I'd love to hear from you. Call me up. Uh, send me an email. I'd, I'd love to talk. Uh, we will come out, Timothy and I, together. We'll come visit you. We'll come to your organizational meeting. Uh, we're going to be holding lots of opportunities for public comment. And so... Uh, we, we just want to emphasize that the conversation doesn't stop today. So with that, uh, I guess it's time to say goodbye to our panel. Uh, I'd like to thank them again, and if you could help me with a round of applause, I'd appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs>